Welcome to Women in Space online collaboration panel, which is hosted by KCL Women in Physics and KCL Space to student-led societies at King's College London. As two societies focusing on equality and academics, we invited respectful speakers whose work at cosmology and the universe that we really admire. They're also very inspiring and powerful women figure in academia. Therefore, in this panel, we raised very interesting topics to be discussed about, which is, would humans establish settlement bases first on Mars or Moon? The effects of life outside Earth on psychology, research, human space flight, and technology. The panel discussion would be moderated by two committee members from both organizing societies, Pratyashka and Yixin. So first, let's welcome Pratyashka to introduce the speakers. Hello, everyone. So I would be introducing the speakers. So our first speaker is Dr. Einar Sawyer, who is the Chief Health Innovation Officer for the NASA-funded Translation Research Institute for Space Health, specializing in translation technologies for space flight research. And the next speaker we have is Dr. Kap uh, Nicole Kaplan, who is an astrobiology researcher at ESA, specializing in antimicrobial research and biomining for long duration space flight missions. Our third speaker is Dr. Carol Danguaz, who is a medical doctor and former researcher MD for ESA at the Concordia Station in Antarctica. And our fourth speaker is Dr. Rain Irshad, who is an autonomous systems lead uh, and a business lead at HRAF and sample curation at SDFC and is experienced in a wide range of lunar Mars mission discussions and particularly on bringing samples back from space. So we would now like to start with our questions. And the first question would be asked by Yisin. So. so the first question would be, where do you think your research will be in the next 50 years? We would like Dr. Anoa to answer the question for us. I'm sorry, you're muted. Yes, thank yeah. you. So where do you think my type of research will be going in the next 50 years? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that we will be doing things very differently than we do now in healthcare on earth and in space. I think a lot of that's going to come in terms of probably a matrix of sensing capabilities that are minimally intrusive and deliver high value. And they'll, they'll probably be quite ubiquitous and become just a part of the normal fabric. Like we don't see lamp posts on the street anymore. They're just part of our infrastructure. So I think that's the direction we're heading. Um, and I think these sensors are gonna have to be really smart. Uh, smart, not just about the type of data they deliver. So what I call giving us not all the information, but data that matters or the metadata, I call it. And then also, I think we're going to need to even be smart about how the sensors are powered. Uh, and that in terms of either self-powering sensors or low-powered sensors or recyclable or sustainable uh, powering. And I, I also think, obviously, the integration and uh, the actionable insights generated by the sensors will be key. But I think that'll be much more ubiquitous, just like our power and now internet infrastructure that we see. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Like he brings us a very inspiring picture for the future. And probably um, we would like to invite Dr. Nicole to answer the question as well. So where I see the area of astrobiology research going, um, well, in terms of what I do at ESA, so I'm a project scientist and I'm involved in coordinating the science side of several astrobiology experiments. Um, and they're all at the moment on the International Space Station. So they're all ISS experiments. 
Um, some of them are inside the station and some of them are also outside the station because they're interested in external and internal experiments. Um, but looking ahead to the future, we want to go beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Uh, the European Space Agency is very keen on uh, exploration uh, deeper into space and our next stop will be in lunar orbit. We're looking to plan experiments, um, to run experiments on the gateway, the NASA gateway. The European, uh, the European Space Agency has a part, uh, quite a large part to play in gateway and we want to, to do some experiments on gateway. And then looking further ahead, of course, to Mars. So, uh, yeah, that sounds like really interesting, deep inside the space which is kind of like I didn't imagine before. And then we would like to invite Dr. Carol to answer the question. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. That's great, um, very kind and a great panel of um, interesting, interesting, accomplished uh, women. Uh, so first of all, my, my background is actually I'm a critical care doctor. Um, so I kind of came upon the space, space medicine kind of industry because of a passion uh, about space. And I was lucky enough to be the research MD for ESA at Concordia um, in Antarctica. So I contributed to some research uh, in that year, but that's not my kind of current field really. Um, but there are, there are very, in very interesting links between kind of space medicine and uh, healthcare here on earth. Um, so that's extremely interesting. And um, what I see for the next 50 years, I think, um, of course, Dr. Sawyer's uh, comments were, were spot on about having kind of more precise and less invasive sensors. And I think we would want to bring that for our critical care patients uh, down here on our units. Um, but I, I also see uh, quite a lot of potential for personalization of medicine. Uh, so kind of you know, we're starting to understand how space affects the body. Uh, we're still finding things, um, how, it, how it affects us, how it affects the physiology. Um, but as we, as we understand the mechanisms behind what happens, it's trying to really pinpoint these and really um, trying to, to make sure that uh, bodies stay healthy in space. And that has uh, repercussions for us here for our patients. You know, there are lots of similar similarities uh, between, for example, Concordia, which is a hypoxic environment, uh, hypoxic uh, hyperbaric, so less oxygen, um, being at altitude, being in space, because that's one of the options that we would want on deep space missions. Um, but also critical ill um, patients, uh, you know, COVID-19 patients, that's exactly the conditions that they're exposed to, less oxygen um, in their bodies. So yeah, uh, personalization of medicine. Um, and then again, like Dr. Sari mentioned, kind of using big data. Um, so I listened to some extremely interesting sessions this week, all about that, how, you know, when you have a, a patient in front of you, um, there's only so much you can get from your clinical exams from looking at all the, the variables from the different monitors that we have for our patients. But some things the eye just can't see, uh, like patterns, uh, for example, you know, there's, there's a lot of study going into heart rate variability, and that's something that computers need to help us with um, mm. to get these patterns. So yeah, that's what I yeah. see for the next 50 years. It sounds like there will be huge developments in healthcare with aims from deep space missions and big data. And also, could please, Dr. Rain, to answer the question, what's your in research interest or any potential developments in the next 50 years? Well, in the next decade or so, we're working to uh, bring back samples from the moon and Mars. And uh, I've been helping to develop the technology that will help us to do that. Uh, collectively, as a community, there is a global exploration strategy for space. And the emphasis in the coming decades is to do the work that ultimately will culminate in sending humans to work on the moon and Mars. 
And to do that, we're going to need to develop some very innovative technology. I think that's what we're going to be concentrating on over the next 50 years is um, developing the technology for in situ resource utilization. So it can cost up to $50,000 a kilo just to put something into Earth orbit, which means it's not viable to be sending all the equipment for building moon bases, all the food for astronauts, uh, all of the technology to make sure you have enough oxygen. So we need to ensure that we can use the resources in the locations that we're sending these people to and ensure that that will allow them to survive. Um, on the Mars 2020 mission, there's going to be an experiment called MOXIE that's looking at extracting oxygen from the atmosphere. And it's that technology that hopefully we will develop in the coming decades that eventually will be on a large enough scale to allow human-led research to take place on the Moon and Mars. And hopefully that will mean that in about 50 years or so, we will end up with a Moon base, um, primarily for research. I don't think at the moment we're going to be even in 50 years looking at uh, long-term settlement, but those bases hopefully will be there to allow human research, uh, research to take place in a way that machines can't do and that we need people to undertake. Um, as, as someone mentioned earlier, we're aiming to have a lunar gateway, so a platform uh, like a space station around the moon that serves as a stepping stone to deeper parts of the solar system, including Mars. So hopefully that will mean that we should have managed to send the first humans to Mars in about 50 years or so, uh, I think is the aim. That sounds really I have, exciting. I have a question for you though. So do yeah, you please. feel that, do you feel uh, humans would settle slash have a research basis on Mars first or a uh, moon first? I think it has to be the moon. And uh, it, it has to be because um, Mars is so far away that there, there isn't room for error and there aren't room for mistakes. We have to make sure that we develop the technology in advance. And the moon is a fantastic platform to allow us to do that. It's close enough that we can keep going back. We do develop the Lunar Gateway. Um, that means we're going to have um, a space station that again can be used as a base to go backwards and forwards to the moon. So if there are any mistakes, if there are errors in the technology that means that we're not producing enough oxygen to allow those people to survive or something goes wrong, then we have the ability to bring them back and repair. Whereas if we aim for, uh, we aim for Mars first, then we're not allowing ourselves that room to make sure that we can mitigate any errors that happen. Yes, just, just I just wanted to echo, um, I just wanted to echo what you said. I mean, it really will be a case of using the moon as a proof of concept for living off planet and all of the technologies that we're developing for the moon will for sure be duplicated um, or improved upon for, for Mars and deeper space. And I think it's especially important when we think about trying to make this shift from augmented to autonomous health and medical management. Uh, we have an opportunity to use the ISS as an analog for the moon and the moon as an analog for deep space. And as we're moving over towards that precision space health continuum powered by sensing matrices and all of these things of the human and the environment, I think we really need to have that stepping stone of the moon where we're mostly synchronous communication for if we need it, but there are times where it's asynchronous and we can actually create challenges where we make it all asynchronous as we're trying to do somewhat on the ISS with some pilot studies because we've got to eventually move from augmented to autonomous and closed loop processes for health optimization and medical management. So I think those natural stepping stones uh, of ISS moon to Mars really do make sense. Um, I completely agree with, uh, with all of you. Um, I think it would be foolish really not to use the moon uh, for it to help our, our understanding. Um, and you know the setbacks would be so huge if we had a failed mission to Mars. If we tried to rush it, uh, you know it would set us back 
like decades and decades that you know the backlash i think on earth would be huge um so yeah it's just i mean we have the moon three days three days from here why why not go there it just it doesn't make sense and we'll leverage information from the moon back to terrestrial healthcare in that interim instead of making that gigantic leap to Mars. So, so much to gain by on medical advances uh, yeah. from what we learned from the moon. Exactly. It's not waste of time, it's all gain of knowledge. So. And it's still exciting. <laughs> The other thing I think that's worth mentioning is that there are still unknowns when it comes to Mars that could have an impact on human settlement. And that includes the long standing question of whether or not life exists, or more likely, whether or not life existed at some point on Mars. We go through quite intensive processes of planetary protection, so making sure that we don't accidentally contaminate um, the biosphere on Mars with. Um, biological material from Earth. And part of that is, uh, you know, making sure that we don't destroy any life that might actually be on there, but also to make sure that we don't contaminate it. Um, so when we are doing life detection measurements, if we find something, we need to make sure that that is something that's Martian. It's not, you know, an accident as a result of an engineer sneezing on a lens. Um, as, as well as being embarrassing, it would set back the science that we have. If we send people to Mars without really understanding what's happening there, then again, we run the risk of contaminating uh, what might already exist there and potentially risking future science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And, and that's why um, it's so important to get a good understanding of what's actually going on or on and in the planet um, before, we, before we set foot. So, um, so missions like uh, ESA's uh, ExoMars, uh, the two-part mission, so a trace gas water that's been in orbit since uh, 2016, is looking uh, looking at Mars from a distance, and then uh, and then the ExoMars rover, which should uh, sh I think it will be launched 2022, um, has had a series of delays up until up until now, but it is is slated for launch in 2022. And that will have a, um, a whole suite of scientific instruments uh, on the rover itself, including a drill that is capable of drilling two and a half meters into the subsurface and, and extracting, extracting samples that we feel would be relevant um, to astrobiology. So sending robots there first uh, to do a little bit of the heads up legwork uh, really makes sense. And then the and then I think it's time to, to send the scientists astronauts. And the other thing as well is um, alongside ExoMars, we have the Mars 2020 mission, which is the precursor. Um, or a, again, it's a, it's a two-part mission. The Mars 2020 rover is going to be going out there to um, primarily to collect rock and soil samples um, and then to stash them secretly <laughs> across the surface. And then um, in 2030, we're aiming to send the sample fetch rover, which um, hopefully should be a British rover as well. And um, that is going to be there to go to Mars in a giant game of interplanetary hide and seek. And it's going to go around and fetch up all, all of these samples to collect them, put them on an ascent vehicle and bring them back to Earth. And hopefully that will mean we will have the first samples of another planet coming back to Earth in 2030 that may potentially contain biological material. Wow, that sounds really amazing. I've heard about news on nature about the new discovery of pH3, a uh, kind of material that indicate biological life on Mars. Yeah, that would be like really exciting to have the sample. So shall, shall we invite, like welcome Patia Sha to ask the second question um yeah so the second question would be so i like how in the previous discussion we all came together and you all gave comments in each other's comments and brought the debate forward but now i would like to ask all of you to talk about your individual research it's very briefly for us to see the varied background, background that we have everyone coming in from so we'd start from uh, with dr einar sawyer 
Oh, thank you. Um, so we'll step backwards and do the, the background intro, um, if, if that's what you're asking for, because I think it, it helps uh, give context to the various expertise around the table here, which is I'm really honored to be in this conversation with my panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon at UCSF in San Francisco, and I direct the skeletal health service. So my clinical work is all about bone, but across the last couple of decades, I've been involved in health technology. Across my whole career, I've been involved in trying to help people take better care of themselves in their own environments. Uh, and so I work a lot in remote medical management, trying to build out distributed healthcare models and uh, augment them with technology and even innovation in personnel and process where necessary. So I have also gone beyond the healthcare world into covering extreme athletes. I cover ocean rowers as an expedition medic, and that's what I thought was the edge case of remote medical management. Um, but it turns out that uh, space is actually the ultimate edge case for remote medical management. And it's also the forcing function for solving many of the problems we're trying to solve in healthcare on earth. Uh, so I really, I feel very honored to be able to do this type of work. As I mentioned before, a lot of my work is involved in how can we create a health sensing matrix that would be the underpinning or the engine for precision health or precision space health in this environment. Okay. Thank you so much. We would now like to ask Dr. Nicole Kaplan to answer the same question. Yes, so um, my background, strictly I'm an environmental scientist um, or radioecologist. Uh, previously to ESA, I studied the effects that low-dose ionizing radiation has on higher plants. Um, and then that kind of carried on uh, into what effect does space radiation have on plants and then what effect does space radiation have on biology in general and that's kind of how I am um, in astrobiology so uh, now I'm a research fellow um, in astrobiology at ESA and I'm acting uh, as project scientist uh, coordinating uh, several experiments all to do with astrobiology uh, on the International Space Station. So was your um, undergraduate education in biology or astrobiology? Uh, my undergraduate background is environmental science. Oh, okay. Which okay. I think is quite rare for somebody going into, into biology. And then I specialise later on as a, as a radio ecology slash plant biology PhD. You, you, you can, I can wear many hats depending on who I'm speaking to. So uh, <laughs> yeah, there's lots of crossover things. Okay, so our next question, I mean, uh, Dr. Carol, now you could answer the same. Yes. Uh, lots of fascinating backgrounds. Um, so my, my own is that, um, yes, I, I'm a medical doctor and prior to that I did a BSc in biochemistry um, before applying for, for medical school. Um, I'm a specialist in general internal medicine and critical care. Uh, I've been in the UK, UK for a few years now. I'm trying to get my equivalency here, which is not that straightforward. Um, and uh, this year on top of that, so I'm uh, learning some extra skills in anesthesia uh, and I'm about to start a fellowship in pre-hospital medicine uh, kind of rescue ambulance rescue uh, medicine uh, and I've also started a, a master in extreme medicine at the University of Exeter um, again trying to combine kind of all my passions uh, I absolutely love the outdoors I love remote medicine and critical care um, and yes, I was fortunate in uh, 2017 to be the research MD for the European, European Space Agency uh, at Concordia. And my main projects of research there, so I wasn't, I wasn't the principal investigator at all. I was the technician kind of for research teams from throughout Europe and the world actually. Um, so I had some research on immunity and kind of immune dysregulation in these kinds of uh, extreme environments. Um, there was another research project uh, called Bone Health on kind of bone and muscle, um, again, dysregulation in these kinds of environments. And there was this third big study on psychology and how, how these um, being in these confined and isolated uh, environments can influence group dynamics and uh, kind of personal mood. 
Um, and then there was a final study sim skill on a piloting skill with a very cool Soyuz simulator and trying to see whether um, kind of stressful environments, but also hypoxic environments can explain perhaps a deterioration in kind of fine motor skills and uh, cognitive skills. Um, again, in that case, with the very, very practical, um, you know, repercussions of if you're trying to fly to Mars, will the astronauts still be able to land their, their spaceship uh, on Mars after many, many months of a very monotonous environment? And so, yeah, that's my background. Okay, and uh, finally, we'd like Dr. Ishad to answer. So I'm the Autonomous Systems Lead at RAL Space, uh, which is part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council, Research Council. Uh, I work on uh, developing and building space instruments, and then I try to find other exciting and valuable uses for that technology here on Earth as well. Uh, so I'm a systems engineer and a physicist by training, um, and it's a systems engineer's job to look at the bigger picture. So basically to make sure that the instrument or the system that you're building works together effectively in all its little parts to do the overall job that it's designed to do. And that really appealed to me because I've never been one of those people who wants to specialize and learn absolutely everything about one little niche area. I really like seeing the whole and how everything fits together. And so systems engineering was fantastic. It gave me an opportunity to learn a little bit about everything. Um, then early on in my career, I started working on uh, the size SP project, uh, which was to build a seismometer to send to Mars. And that ended up being part of NASA's InSight mission. So I worked on that as the um, product assurance manager, so making sure that everything um, is done correctly, and the planetary protection officer. And that meant that it was my job to make sure that we didn't accidentally um, contaminate the hardware with any biological material, um, and that um, we, you know, we didn't cause um, any damage to it, which meant that it wouldn't be performing properly. So that really started my interest in Mars in particular, and I've ended up spending a lot of time working on Mars missions as a result of that. Okay, um, now I would like Yisen to take over and ask the next question. You're muted. Sorry. Um, the next question I would ask is, your opinion on the commercialization of space? Should there be boundaries and how do you think it would impact academic space research? So um, our first speaker would be Dr. Anoy. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I, I think it's a, an exciting way to exponentially increase uh, the capacity of, our, of human exploration in space. Uh, is to engage commercialization of space. So I do think though, it's gonna be important that we have global governance and that we work very cooperatively around the world so that we can minimize the risk of unintended consequences. And by that, I, I'm, you know, as you bring in different drivers and in different incentives that, than what the government programs may have, you also need to make sure that there aren't opportunities for malicious interventions or unintended consequences. Um, so that I think a global governance is gonna be important. I think the opportunities in healthcare are tremendous though, because we'll soon be flying people who are not optimized. If they're not the optimal physical specimen going in or mental specimen, they're not trained up. They might be uh, of all kinds of substrate, shall we say, uh, various age groups, underlying conditions, et cetera, different risk factors. And I think we're going to learn a tremendous amount about the effects uh, of space travel on these individuals um, and also learn new ways to monitor and new ways to create countermeasures as we move into that. That will be exciting to have individual space travel in the future. Um, shall we have Dr. 
Nicole to answer the question as well? Sure. I mean, what Dr. Sawyer has just um, just spoken about is very, very important. And that's this governance. When you have all of these new and emerging, exciting commercial players, you also have to wonder what that's going to mean for the exploration landscape. Um, in terms of rights for exploration, um, well, that's just one of the things that also, like Dr. Ashad said, planetary protection measures. At the moment, COSPAR have the guidelines on planetary protection, but it's not yet enshrined into law. Um, this, this, is, this is a really tricky subject. I can take the example of, uh, you might have remembered the headline where the tardigrades crash landed on the moon from the Bereshit lander. And there was uproar and uh, there was lots of press and, and lots, of, lots of people panicking on the phone um, about these tardigrades, which uh, purportedly survive anything. And all of a sudden they've been spilled onto the moon. Now, in that case, the moon has a category of destination, which is not of biological research interest. So in terms of Maybe um, there's something wrong with Dr. Nicole's internet. Shall we wait to until she join back to us? I think she mentioned she might have to switch to her mobile network. Okay, then we just wait for a little bit. Give us more time to think. <laughs> Uh, I have um, a question to Dr. Sawyer about the answer you gave and a similar question to Dr. Kathleen and anyone else who perhaps answers this question. It, um, what about the known risks of outer space travel um, like radiation, which we know is very, very harmful, but for things like going to the moon, which is a very short journey, it might not have that significant of an impact. Whereas long-term space flight, commercial sp space flight might, and it will definitely impact people negatively. So do you think a government uh, would approve this and should they approve this for, especially for people, as you said, of different categories with um, different health and mental conditions? Well, I'm hoping that we can have a uh some agreement and consensus statements around screening criteria because I think it would be reckless to send up anyone whose whose qualification was they could write a big enough check. I mean I really feel like we need some sort of medical screening and at this point it's not there is no consensus in fact the private companies don't actually have their own criteria yet. So I think that's another way in which a global governance body and a global research body could really play a role in establishing some of those safe protocols and practices. We're, we're not hearing you. Maybe we can move ahead and ask Dr. Carroll the same question that Yisin asked initially, till Captain Buttons coming. Civilization yeah, sure. Um So I might uh, I might just bring an element of answer coming from a different background. So having worked in Antarctica, uh, which as you may know has actually been protected since 1959, I believe, by the Antarctic Treaty, uh, which was has been signed by most countries on the earth, not all, uh, and which actually protects Antarctica as a whole continent that's dedicated to science only. Um, so commercial enterprises are not kind of permitted. So you do have tourism, um, but apart from that, you know, you can't mine for resources in Antarctica. Uh, you can't have any kind of radionuclear uh, ventures in Antarctica. Um, and that's kind of exactly the opposite of what's happening obviously with space now. Um, so I don't believe, I don't believe we should do the same for space. Uh, but definitely we have to make sure from the start that we venture in a kind of open and inclusive 
uh, in a very transparent way to space um, from the start, get it right, because whatever decisions we make now will have repercussions you know, for centuries to come. Um, and I would hate for you know, space to become very kind of unilateral or some countries getting way ahead of others or I think it has to be the whole of humanity that goes out um, and really yeah, shares everything that we can learn from that. Are you in Antarctica right now? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm in North Wales, no. It's actually really, really difficult to go to Antarctica, especially, I mean, this year even more. Uh, but no, I'd love to, but no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's I'm not. Okay. Um, I think the next person would be Dr. Irshad to answer the question. Well, I think uh, commercialization is one of those things that's, it's a necessary, in some ways, an inevitable step. Uh, space exploration is expensive. And with an exploding population, with a climate under crisis, there are very limited resources to go around and other priorities that are vying for money. I know we, we always end up having to answer the question about justifying um, doing space research and space exploration at a time when there are other crises going on on Earth. Uh, so if we want to progress at a reasonable pace, then we will need to be looking at private investments. Uh, on top of that, in some ways, we've been commercializing space for a long time in relative terms, so with uh, telecommunications. So it's not a new concept, but the, the whole dawn of uh, SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin and their ilk, we are beginning to see the commercialization of exploration, and that is new. Um, it does open up the possibility for greater collaboration between academia and industry, which is never a bad thing, um, and it can lead to more um, positive impact like job creation, uh, faster routes to market for terrestrial applications, and generally greater benefits to local economies and things like that. But um, I think the priorities for commercial entities are different to those to the research communities. And so we have to be wary of private entities inadvertently causing harm by cutting corners or doing things that might um, be good for them because they increase their profit margins, um, but aren't necessarily for the greater good. So for example, um, we had that news of SpaceX launching Elon Musk's Tesla towards Mars. And while that was an entertaining and striking picture and it certainly brought space into the fore in people's minds, um, the activity in itself completely ignored planetary protection considerations that were a tenet of the United Nations Outer Space Treaty. So and we do actually have a treaty that looks at um, global agreements to what we do in space and that it's about having peaceful exploration and again i think there are rules about um using the moon for or claiming any one nation claiming the moon for a commercial enterprise we we've agreed globally that that's not on um, but if that tesla for example crashed into somewhere that could potentially harbor life there's likely to be a horde of biological material and contaminants that could cause serious problems if you you know, and want to do any decent scientific research or want to contaminate somewhere that, you know, potentially could be the only source of um, extraterrestrial life. And that's if we ignore the fact that we're trying to limit the amount of junk that we're sending into space. So there are other conditions, considerations that we have to take into account. And I completely agree that having some form of global governance that looks at um, the behavior and the activities of the commercial enterprises and ensures that we're all working together effectively and safely towards a common goal is absolutely a good idea. One, yeah, I thought one would hope that that Tesla uh, started off life in a clean room somewhere. Um, I don't know the specifics of, of that mission, um, but yeah, indeed, if that crashed onto somewhere of biological um, research interest significance, then you're gonna run into problems. And as I was kind of saying before I cut off, I'm not sure how much you, you heard about that, um, the, the, the tardigrades on the moon um, business. Had that had been on the Mar or Mars, <laughs> 
then we would be in a very uh, different uh, different scenario in terms of exploration if we've sent known biological samples to that area or any area of Mars. There was a, a talk given recently by one of the planetary protection officers at NASA. Um, he's worked on several missions. He commented on this and said the key thing here was lack of communication. As you mentioned, the moon is uh, a low category in terms of planetary protection. So it's not considered to be of biological interest. If someone had actually asked whether it would be, whether it would be okay, whether it'd be you know, reasonable to send an experiment containing tardigrades to the moon, the answer would probably have been, yes, that's okay. But um, the problem comes when there isn't communication um, and therefore there aren't any considerations about mitigation in case something does crash, which in this case does happen. And so that again calls for the need for global governance and more communication. Well, the, the creator of that foundation and that mission, Nova Spivak, has um, openly said that he wasn't actually going to tell anybody about the tardigrades until they crashed on the moon. And he saw it honestly as a huge PR opportunity and I mean, it was, it was a massive PR opportunity um, uh, to exploit and it was front page news everywhere. Um, so I can understand it from that perspective, but at the same time, if it was on Mars or somewhere else, then um, yeah, different repercussions. I think that will be one of our greatest challenges is the p potential for misaligned incentives and drivers. And I do think that's where the, I'm glad you brought it up, Dr. Carol, the Antarctic Treaty has done such a beautiful job of trying to keep in alignment on those things. Um, but it's more challenging when you have financially driven entities involved. Okay, so um, we have the next question for everyone which is actually one of my favorite in the list of questions. It is about um, what is your opinion on human settlement on other celestial bodies? And how do you feel about space? How do you feel space agriculture ties into that? Or like livestock, like cloning meat? And how do you think that would turn out in future? So our first speaker would be Dr. Sawyer. Well, thank you. I sometimes love to listen to the others because they're so brilliant and I can pick up on things to say, but I did review the questions ahead of time and I've been thinking about this, of course. Uh, I think it's incredibly important as one of our other speakers brought out that we learn to be self-sustaining wherever we are, not just to rely on a transport of everything we need back and forth. And certainly that's true for nutrition, hydration, like individual human sustainability concepts. So I do think there's a tremendous amount of exciting work going on on creating nutrient dense foods from duckweed to other types of synthetic foods. But I think also we're looking at plants uh, giving us the ability to generate pharmaceuticals. And there's a project within Trish right now looking at how lettuce could produce uh, parathyroid hormone uh, analogs so to treat bone health, which back to my, my own clinical work. So I think there are many ways in which we're going to get creative and obviously scientific uh, about how we're gonna generate our own food sources. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would ever see us uh, taking uh, livestock to space, you know, the, the phrase in the U.S. anyway of when pigs fly, <laughs> I think it's kind of far off, uh, but I do think that there are other ways we can create the, the nourishment that we need, um, and I think that's an exciting field. I think the other exciting thing is looking at how do we create water, uh, which we don't have, and water with the right concentrations, and there are lots of groups working on that, particularly for IVs in low resource settings where you can't just slog around a whole bunch of bags of fluid. So it's again pushing the envelope and solving problems for Earth, um, but it's it's incredibly important. How do we create a sustainable environment? Okay, so we would like to now hear from Dr. Kaplan. Well, as Dr. Sawyer said, it's all about being self-sustaining off-planet. It's not 
economically, environmentally feasible to keep shipping uh shipping supplies to to other planets that we uh that we want to colonize, uh, colonize. now with uh with, with plants a lot of research is going into both plants as as uh, as crops so to, to grow crop plants um, off planet um but also in terms of bioregenerative life support systems looking at the use of algae um, and, and generating uh, generating energy and, and water and nutrients and everything that we need um, to sustain ourselves uh, beyond Earth. Now, I worry about um, when people talk about uh, populating Mars or the Moon. I my, my personal standpoint is that yes space is for everyone and, and the knowledge gain and the earth benefits are certainly for everyone but i'm worried that i'm worried for the planet that people are, are going to be wanting to abandon earth that is suffering as a result of humanity and looking ahead to living uh, living on the moon or living on mars i don't want people to think of the earth as a as a previous relationship um, and then they're going to start anew somewhere else. I really think that if we're going to be doing things on the moon and the Mar and, and then on Mars, it's got to benefit everybody back home on Earth. Okay. Um, I would now like to ask Dr. Um, Carol to answer this, but also if you could add in how you think healthcare would um, tie into this, like how would you get the things needed for healthcare? And how would that be transported to different bodies of planets where this thing, uh, where people are settling? Okay, uh, well, lots of questions into this one. Uh, yeah, so agriculture is definitely not my field at all, uh, but I can add maybe a few elements of uh, answer more kind of from personal experience. Um, so personally, I'm vegetarian kind of slash trying veganism so I definitely don't want to bring livestock <laughs> up in space uh, and I think there is a rational anyways for having kind of plant-based food that has a higher content kind of per weight in a nutritious content um, and definitely you know we're struggling here on earth to have like protein come from meat uh, in terms of what it requires uh, resources wise you know water and land so I don't imagine that would um, work on other planets. Um, it's been in the news, I think, though, recently of having kind of meat grown from cells in special vats with like nutrient-rich broths. So yeah, that might be an avenue, but I think uh, we're still some way to that. And there's, as, they, as a journalist has said, kind of the yuck factor of eating a lab-grown meat. Uh, but yeah, lo lots and lots of research actually is going into this. How will we sustain ourselves? Um, and there is definitely a lot to investigate uh, about nutritionally kind of enriched foods that could be countermeasures for so many of the issues that we have in space. Um, you know, one of the biggest ones, again, being immune dysregulation and how can uh, different vitamins perhaps help help us counter that. Um, so that, that's one aspect. Uh, another thing, again, I wanted to mention just from personal experience in Antarctica, um, during my mission, you know, we have nine months where we can't, we have no link whatsoever. So whatever food we, we have with us on the station is what we'll have for the next year. Um, and that, that was a struggle, actually, uh, you know, just eating frozen food for the whole, whole year. I mean, it was cooked. We had a chef, so that was amazing. Uh, but you do realize the importance of food for mental well-being and having varied food and fresh food. Um, so I think there's a huge element that we need to look into that. Um, a side effect of the Antarctic Treaty is that you can't grow anything in Antarctica to preserve um, kind of what, whatever life there is over there. So Dr. Kaplan will know quite a lot about this. Um, I think some stations are having kind of hydroponic um salads but i think that's borderline accepted um and so yeah you can't really grow your own salads or have like an orange tree in the station um so that that was extremely difficult and then coming back to animals 
we even for kind of mental well-being you're not allowed dogs or cats or fishes or <laughs> anything i mean they they would struggle to survive anyways at concordia because it's elevated uh, and again hypoxic environment but yeah so lots and lots of kind of other avenues coming for that um and then your your other question regarding healthcare. um so i think we'll have to be extremely inventive uh, because um as others have mentioned, the, the weight per volume is so huge. Uh, you know, you can't bring a whole hospital over to Mars or Moon. Uh, even you know, imaging, for example, the, the best that we can do on the ISS is ultrasound. And research on the ISS has actually meant um, that we've we've gotten better at miniaturizing uh, ultrasound uh, and uh, becoming autonomous in doing that. So it will definitely lead into development into miniaturizing um, kind of the, the research that we took with us. There's also 3D printing, obviously, which is uh, going to be, we're going to have to rely obviously on that. And uh, we can't bring a scan with us, but I don't know, uh, one day could we maybe 3D print a scan once we're on Mars? Um, when I was at Concordia, I actually had a mini kind of scan where I could do very limited sections of, um, and that's how I analyze kind of bone and bone and muscle development. So I think there's, it's exciting. Um, and going back to one of your questions, you know, the space medicine, there's so many fields that apply to it. You can be an engineer, an astrobiologist, um, you know, a doctor, uh, just going to law there's just so so many things fields to research for for i agree not colonizing but at least exploring space i'm sorry i have so many antarctica questions it's just very exciting <laughs> to hear this but why can't they just fly in fresh food every week so during the during the winter months uh so from february to kind of october late october um it gets just too cold so kerosene just freezes uh, so at Concordia, the mean temperature is minus 50 over the whole year, uh, and it goes down to minus 80 in the worst, and that's without the windshield. There's the polar night also, um, so planes would just struggle to land. I mean, there's no landing, they just land in the snow really. Um, and yeah, so I think a few years ago, they managed uh, a rescue mission to the South Pole Station, but it took two weeks to organize. It was obviously for a very, very kind of high risk. They haven't said what the issue was, but um, it was for an emergency. Uh, but it put everyone's, even the pilots' lives, kind of at risk. Um, so yeah, you're kind of stuck there, and that's why it's such a good space analog because it's exactly kind of like going to Mars. You're on your one-way mission, and you have to be autonomous and get on with it. Okay, now we'd like to ask Dr. Ishad the same question, especially because you specialize in this as well, in C2 utilization of... Yeah, I think, and unfortunately, I think we're actually a long way away from human settlement. It is a, it's a cliche of, of science fiction, but the reality is there are just too many barriers to human settlement becoming worthwhile. First of all, there's um, the the technology to support human exploration of anywhere beyond the moon is really quite far off. Um, our work on the space stations over the last few decades has helped us to identify the key factors in sustaining human life in space, but it's also highlighted the difficulties in doing so, um, especially for anywhere that's not just a few hundred kilometers above the earth, so you can't just send things up, you know, when things go wrong or, or repair things that break. Um, we mentioned that you know the cost of sending things is prohibitive and so yes in situ uh, resource utilization is absolutely the way to go um, we're only just beginning to send experiments to look at extracting oxygen so if that experiment in in the coming year is successful then we'll need to look at how we can scale that up um, to a much larger level and that'll be the case for all humans um, we do have research going on at Harwell. There's an STFC advanced manufacturing lab that's been looking at 3D printing using analog regolith. So that is um, 
material that's been created on the earth to be as close as possible to Martian and lunar soil. And they've been looking at how you can 3D print bricks, ultimately with the aim of building a lunar base or building a base on Mars. But again, that technology is um, a long way off. So we've got a fair way to go. Um, and ultimately it's one thing to sustain humans over short-term visits, but long-term settlements in places that are so inhospitable to any life form is it's ultimately really quite impracticable. Um, and I can't see it ever being economically viable as well, because what return could there possibly be other than scientific and that and inspirational? I mean, there is something about seeing human beings on the moon and on another planet um, that is just incredibly inspiring. Um, but without any sort of economic return, it does become very difficult to justify. Um, in terms of agriculture, I would say as a scientist, I'd be very interested in investigating how we can grow things on scale uh, in space. But I'd also want to know that we weren't risking the ecology of whatever planetary body we're inhabiting. So we would need to become self-sustaining if we wanted to inhabit another planet for any length of time. Um, and agriculture would be a key part, but it would need to be contained within its own biosphere to protect the ecology of the planet, as well as to ensure that it would actually survive. As far as livestock goes, again, um, it's not really viable. It would be far more economical and efficient for the astronauts to become uh, vegetarian. Um, but a balanced diet, again, is difficult. So a hardy supply of vitamins, as someone mentioned, would be useful from Earth. If you are talking about um, ways in which you can have a decent amount of protein, then probably the more um, efficient way of going about it rather than sending livestock would be looking at insect-based protein. And certainly we've been looking at that on Earth as um, a form of protein in areas where there isn't a huge amount of food, where they do suffer um, from being able to uh, grow enough food and they suffer from famine. But again, you have the, the difficulty of trying to transport insects in, through space, making sure you don't uh, contaminate the local ecology. And as someone mentioned, there's the yuck factor. <laughs> so um, we're a little way off, but I do think we can reasonably think about short-term visits for the sake of research um, and to be able to say that we've put people on Mars. You, um, if I may, you mentioned the, the printing uh, of um, lunar regolith. Now, that's that's really great for for the building the actual structures um, structures on the moon, structures on the Mars. Um, but a question is also, what do we do in terms of uh, precious metals that we would need for? building uh, communications and, uh, and the like. So this is very early research, but, um, but, but last summer, um, an Easter experiment uh, with uh, the University of Edinburgh sent uh, what I like to dub the, the world's first miniaturized biomining facility um, to the ISS. So this is the BioRock experiment. Um, so the idea of this was to test uh, microbes that would ordinarily uh, be used in biomining processes on Earth uh, to extract uh, to extract minerals and precious metals from basalt so, uh, basalt rock, uh, but we wanted to test this in uh, in various different gravity regimes. So um, so not not just at one g, but in in microgravity on the space station, and then also in uh, simulated uh, Martian gravity to see if there is scope for using microbes to, to, mine, uh, to mine the rock for the resources that we want um, in such a resource utilization. And so far, I mean, they're very, very early experiments, but they seem promising and we have a very long way to go, um, but the groundwork is being done now so that later, so that later we, can, we can extract, uh, extract these uh, minerals and, uh, and and the like from from rock and then this also may have an economic benefit uh, if you think about it the other way there could be resources in space on asteroids for example 
that might be useful on Earth. So there is an economic uh, factor there as well. And there are organisations that have already set up to potentially look at things like asteroid mining. Um, but again, uh, in order to make that efficient and economical, it is looking at using um, robotics and autonomous technology. And um, even at RAL, we've looked at developing rovers for um, exploration of um, lava tubes um, and uh, using the same technology that we might use to explore caves on the earth for uh, prospecting for mining to um, do the same thing on the moon, potentially on asteroids and find ways of developing technology that would be able to do that mining without human interaction and without the need for regular communication back on Earth as well. So that's where the autonomy comes in and that's quite critical. I love hearing from these different disciplines because I spend a lot of time around space health experts and there, there's a company that has a 3D printer on board already called Made in Space and some of my colleagues and I have, we've worked on printing even uh, medical instruments that we might need, but with recyclable filament so it can be reused, et cetera. So you build something that you need for that moment, whether it's for healthcare or something in the mission that you need, and then you can recycle that material and use it again and again. So I think the additive manufacturing side of it is very important. I really love hearing about the concepts from the other disciplines. And I just want to get back to this one concept that it's incredibly important we do this exploration, but not leave Earth behind. And actually, I think one of the important things we look at on each planet is how did it evolve? What could be our future if we don't learn lessons and take better care of our own precious planet? Uh, okay, so now we have the last question of this panel discussion. And Yisun would be asking that. Since we were talking about bio mining and asteroid mining, so I we have a interesting question regarding to that. So can we potentially use asteroid mining like from the asteroid belt as an additional resource when colonizing Mars? So we would like um, Mr. Sawyer to answer the question first? I'll try. This one's way out of my field, but I'm, I'm imagining uh, how I in healthcare might leverage uh, the materials. And I'd be really interested in what's coming back from the astro, asteroid mining. And are there potentially some radio protective features that we could learn or materials we could gather uh, and leverage in healthcare in some way? And someone already mentioned looking at precious metals, et cetera. So I'd be looking at uh, what types of resources are there in the components of these asteroids that we might be able to leverage either to mitigate against or leverage in a protective fashion that they've evolved uh, to have. Okay, I think um, you have raised a very, very interesting question. So uh, shall we have Dr. Nicole to answer the question since you like probably have many thoughts on that. Sure. So in terms of the asteroid mining um, and, and what we can learn from, uh, from microbes that are actually very radio resistant anyway, we know that specific microbes um, like the Dinococcus uh, radiodurans really, really has radio resistant properties on Earth. So that's one of our candidate microbes for then mining an asteroid which could be hugely radioactive, but could still be extracting um, important um, precious metals and, and minerals that, that we could use. In terms of could we use them on Mars? I think certainly, and it makes sense to be using what's already out there. Uh, again, sending, sending our Earth resources, Earth is already um, suffering from enormous depletion of resources anyway. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense to be extracting um, from the Earth and sending it out. Why not use what's out there? The universe, it's huge. Um, so uh, so I, 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 think, I think that that's the way to go is, is, is use what's there. 
we would also want to hear from Dr. Carol. This is probably like not very related to your field. So we probably want to like hear about whether there could be some raw materials related to healthcare um, in the deeper space. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely way out of my field also. But just picking up on a few things that were said just now, um, going back to the previous question and then that kind of ties in with mining. I think one thing that space is teaching us beautifully and again, it was the same in Antarctica, is the concept of recycling and reusing whatever resources you do have uh, kind of endlessly really. Uh, and that's a beautiful concept that we can actually bring back to earth. Um, that was something really, really important at Concordia. You know, whatever we bring there, we have to bring back. Uh, so we spent quite a lot of our time during the year um, really uh, separating whatever materials we had, all of our waste into different, I mean, I've never separated so much, uh, much, much more than we do here. Um, and yeah, everything gets sent back into containers in different parts of the world. Um, I don't think everything is reused, but I mean, there's very much a policy of leaving no waste in Antarctica. And so I think mining, um, mining in space yeah we'll have to follow these principles um i think one question that mining on these asteroid belt um asteroids sorry brings is possibly an ethical question uh, that dr kevin might know a bit about uh, you know we're starting to and there are lots of theories how did life evolve on earth was it from kind of comets or asteroids crashing into earth and bringing something from me outer solar system or even other galaxies. And then what do you make of that? If you start destroying asteroids, were they like the harbingers of life on other planets in the future? Uh, I think that's quite interesting, very science fiction, but um, yeah, there's that. And then regarding uh, healthcare, yeah, it, it's simply, it's not, it's not my field, but, but definitely I would think there are things that we could use. Um, I really like the comment from Dr. Kaplan about fighting these radiation resistant microbes and learning from that. Um, so that would tie in probably with another question that you had about augmenting astronauts. Uh, that's a whole other minefield, of course. And you know what can we learn from these extremophile bacteria and organisms on Earth? And what are the implications for sending out humans that might be exposed to the same risks and yeah. but that's a whole other question <laughs> so you, you touched on um the panspermia theory so the theory that life brought here on other celestial bodies and i'm it, it's really it's really good to to hear that there is another view um where we're questioning the ethics of actually going to those asteroids um, because that's actually often discussed. Uh, and when you talk about planetary protection, we talk about the planets not contaminating planets, but asteroids. Yeah, there's there's there's, there's not been much discourse, um, community, or not recently anyway, um, on that. So that's that's a really really interesting uh, interesting point for consideration. I led a study a couple of years ago looking at um, the likelihood of transfer of biological material between bodies. And at the time, specifically, we were thinking about the transfer of material between Mars and Phobos, one of its moons. Um, and it was a great study because essentially what we were doing was trying to kill different types of uh, biological life, microbial life, um, in all the ways that it might encounter in space to see what would survive and um, what wouldn't. So we were looking at the processes that were involved in transferring uh, life between bodies. We looked at uh, high velocity impact, the things crashing into the surface and what would survive that. Uh, we looked at what would survive different levels of radiation. We looked at what would survive extremes of temperature. And we did find that there were things that seemed almost impossible to kill. Yeah. Um, and that involved us being actually quite careful um, because when we're looking at things like high velocity impact, you've got the risk of material flying all over the place. You can't do that in a BSL-4 level lab. 
So we had to be conservative with the type of biological material we used. So if the things that we were using survived, then um, the chances are that the most hardened type of biological life was would be more likely to survive. But I do think it is very possible that life could have come from somewhere else and that it could be transferred from other bodies as well. But we do assume that asteroids are essentially dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Shad, you answered the question. So, well, I said that this would be the last question, but I, I just can't help but ask this one more question, which is much more relevant to everyone here, which is effects of Mars settlement and subsequent human generations like adaptations and human waste disposal, vitamin deficiency deficiencies and how it would affect humans over decades and how the healthcare industry would um, evolve to encompass the change and find solutions to new problems which might come up being on different celestial bodies. So we'd like to start with Dr. Irshad with this question. Um, I do think it's, um, it's, it's difficult to be able to to say definitively what will happen because again we're we're assuming human long-term human settlement um, as opposed to short-term visitation we already have issues with um in relatively short um visits in space for the astronauts i think the longest has been just over a year um it might be even longer than that um but we we're thinking about all sorts of effects that um are not necessarily what you'd you know immediately imagine i mean people can envisage being in low gravity does um, effectively cause you to grow, it causes you to stretch because you're not being um, compressed down onto the earth. So astronauts tend to gain an inch or two while they're in space. Um, and then that means it takes them a while to get used to walking when they're back on earth um, because you know their bodies have been stretched out. But there are also all sorts of bizarre effects and I, I'm sure that those involved in healthcare can, can talk more extensively about that, but there are things like um, because you have lower levels of gravity, that affects the distribution of blood in your body. Um, it can have an effect on um, the muscle mass of your heart because it's not having to work as hard to pump the, the blood up to your head and around your body, which means that it, it doesn't become as strong. But potentially, once you get back to um, normal gravity, that can cause problems. But at the same time, there can be issues with um, your body thinking, because you've you effectively have a redistribution of blood in your body. You have a sudden rush of blood to your head, thinking that you have too much and therefore destroying a whole load of your blood cells, which again leads to anemia once you get back to earth. So I think part of the question is also going to be um, in that transition. So there's the question of helping humans to survive while they're um, on Mars or on the moon, but there's also working out how best to make sure that they can still survive if they get back to Earth. So I know that one of the, the questions with astronauts is, is trying to create impact training in zero gravity. So trying to give them a form of exercise that allows them to retain bone density, to retain muscle mass, um, when actually it's very difficult to, to have that resistance, to have that impact that you would when you're running, for example, on Earth. Um, so open questions, I think, still, but very interesting things to consider. Now we'd like Dr. Carroll to answer the same. I was actually very curious about uh, Dr. Sawyer's answers. Um, uh, but yes, so I mean, it, it's a it's a really, really interesting topic. Uh, you know, how how do we adapt, I guess, to going out to space, uh, what we can learn from it and kind of whether, how much we can prepare astronauts for when they do go to, to Mars. Um, I think you can kind of break it down into different steps. The first is probably selection. And I think, uh, you know, that's where we're at right now, is trying to select the, the astronauts who will do best in those kinds of situations. Uh, but then that ties in to a few things that we've mentioned about, you know, commercialization of space and opening it up to people who aren't trained or actually fit to go in space. And that that's the whole field of medicine that's opening up right now. Like how how do you um, 
improve those people's chances of, of survival. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're learning so much for, um, you know, for, to take one example, we know that there's a gene um, that favors populations at high altitudes. So Tibetans, for example, uh, they tolerate hypoxia much better. Um, and they've probably selected that over kind of millennia. Um, and, you know, is that something maybe that we would want to look into uh, for astronauts, uh, you know, to make sure that they have that variant? Um, and the, in the very, very interesting thing about that is, you know, you could think astronauts, oh, but that's what, 100 people, uh, a few hundreds maybe on Earth, like how, how is that applicable to the rest of the Earth, humanity, but actually, coming back to my field that has repercussions again in critical care and, um, and uh, respiratory failure. Um, so that, that's really, really interesting. So more first, more kind of finding out about selection. Um, and then the second question this brings us to is, um, I mean, the next step is obviously countermeasures. We've mentioned a bit, um, you know, Dr. Gershon mentioned, you know, countermeasures for microgravity and trying to train astronauts for the difficulties of that. I think we've seen how much astronauts need to be strapped to, not the floor, because there's no concept of floor on the ISS, but to one of the walls and how they have to spend hours and hours uh, really every day exercising and then they still lose bone and muscle density. So there's a lot, um, a lot to learn from improving the efficiency of our countermeasures. But then the next step after that is, can you augment astronauts? And that's, we're, we're not there yet, but I think that will be a huge ethical debate in the next kind of century is, um, you know, you've seen the Nobel Prize in chemistry this year. It was about CRISP um, has nine enzymes and, you know, that's actually modifying our DNA. Uh, you know, some people have argued, you know, what, once we do, or if we do develop, for example, um, the genes that can protect us from radiation. Is it ethically then sound to send astronauts to Mars knowing that they might get cancer, you know, even before they get to Mars, like if you could prevent it. Um, so I think that's a really, really, really interesting field because of course, once you open the door of gene modification, um, it becomes more acceptable and there are obvious, obvious huge risks to that. Now we'd like to hear from Dr. Kaplan. Well, now I'm swimming a little bit out of my depth because if we're talking about human biology, which terrifies me, I might have to rely on um, on some of the other panelists who are to help me out. Um, in in terms of selection, from what I understand, when you're when you're selecting for spaceflight, as it as it is now. I think there's this misconception that you need to send essentially superhumans, 1950s style, uh, right stuff, uh, astronaut candidates that are, that are, you know, have tons of muscles, but because of the effects on the human body, um, I've, I've understood that you should actually be of average fitness. You should be quite an average human because you would in theory suffer less than if you were if you did have an if you had an athlete's body and you had an excess of muscles and and, and all the rest of it then when you came back to earth you would you would find that difficult um much more challenging than someone of average fitness um but again and i'm i'm quite uh i, I feel really strongly about who we will be sending um sending to space i think Going, going for a jolly, going for a holiday is uh, it's kind of on a lot of people's minds, especially with the commercialization. But I still really think that we should be sending the scientists, um, scientists of an average fitness. I think it's going to be um, realistically uh, speaking. But um, but then is is that ethical that you're then deciding? I mean, and who ultimately will be deciding? Is it going to be? enshrined into law is it going to be a you know is, is selection going to be outside of agency decision is this going to be something something bigger um, and then all of the ethical questions um, that goes along with that and uh, with discrimination for example um, so they're just huge huge questions and 
settlement is so far ahead of us. I personally don't think we'll see it in our lifetime. Um, but uh, but we're doing we're doing the groundwork uh, so that our, our great 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 grandchildren might be able to uh, thank us one day. Um, but yeah, who knows. Okay, and we finally have Dr. Sawyer to answer the same question. Well, when I think about the long duration of deep space travel to Mars, uh, we think in terms of a minimum of three years, perhaps, um, which isn't really a settlement, but that's a long time. And so if I just look at that framework initially, I think we have a lot to learn. As someone mentioned earlier, we know a lot about six months or below effects on the body of being in space. We know a little about beyond that, and there is the one-year mission where we're going to be trying to get more people into that environment for a year. But what we do know is some of the systems reach a new homeostasis. So maybe in about six weeks, some of the fluid shifts, you start to adapt. Instead of having massive cephalad shift and not much in the legs, the chicken legs and the puffy face, some of that evens out. Unfortunately, what the body Body does is sense that you're fluid overloaded and you diurese or pee a lot of it off. So you end up really under uh, the volume status you'll need, especially when you return to Earth. But you do reach some plateaus on some systems. That has not been shown with bone and muscle. The bone and muscle loss, as far out as the missions have gone, have continued. And I think we're going to see in other systems that the longer the duration flights, we're going to have systems that continue to decline. Uh, and from which we may not have full recovery when people return from those long missions. And I think those are things we need to think a lot about. I think that we really do need to talk about precision. So we're all on this, all of us on earth even go from wellness to illness and back again. Uh, but what we'd like to do is catch deflections from wellness, deflections from an optimal state of being sense those, whether it's hydration, fatigue, uh, stress, or even respiratory distress, sense it and then return that person with an actionable insight back to their optimal state. And what I mean by that is that prevents them from deteriorating down a clinical path. So I think in these long duration missions, prevention is gonna be really, really key and in an individualized approach. So combining precision with that. Another way to think of precision is this concept someone brought up earlier is sort of a genomic uh, aptitude for space travel and space adaptations. And I think we certainly are trying to do some of that on Earth just in terms of um, quantifying risk and predicting risk of disease states. But I think also we could look at that in terms of predicting risk for these altered environments. Um, and I think maybe we would think about genetic or genomic interventions later. CRISPR is extremely exciting. But before we even got to that, we could be our own tissue banks. We could be for stem cell therapies, which are looking more and more promising. We're going to have our own stem cells that we take up there with us. And if we could leverage them and use them like the mesenchymal stem cells, which we're using to drive into fracture healing, et cetera, other types of tissue repair. So as our own tissue banks and our own blood banks, we could use them in a very smart way uh, that, that we're, we're looking into, just looking into right now. Um, so I, I do think that there are many opportunities for us to think about more long-term uh, sustainability while we're minimizing risk by preventing clinical deterioration um, and then also leveraging the, our own resources that we take up there and taking up optimized, optimized people by selection as well as training. Um, and, and I think it's really important that we think about what state are they going to arrive in when they land to do planetary work from microgravity for months to partial gravity and are they going to be ready physically, functionally to withstand the loads that they're going to need to and, and how do we prepare them for that? Those are things that, you know, we don't, we don't talk a lot about those transitions, but there are concepts also around intermittent gravity, not just as a countermeasure, but also as preparatory, either for landing back on earth or landing on a planetary surface. So I think there are lots of really interesting ways to explore what does it mean to spend more time, longer duration, and again, with this whole superimposed challenge of asynchronous, so all closed loop processes. Wow. <laughs> okay, thank you for this um, very interesting 
um, point of view. So would anyone else like to comment on that? Because after that, we'd be ending the panel discussion. I guess thank you for letting me be part of this conversation. I would love to have a deeper conversation with each person on this right now. It was so fascinating. I learned a lot. Yeah, we learned a lot from you too. And from everyone else who was a part of this panel discussion, we would all like to really thank you for taking out the time and coming to join us. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your patience and kind kindness.